up. Coding is okay, so Martin, it's up to you. Okay, so here we are, the session number three. Uh, Martin will ho hopefully continue with the theoretical methodological foundations of bi-level optimization. Uh, the session will be one and a half hour long, and after that we will have a break, and after that we will have a joint exercise session in the breakout rooms. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I start screen sharing again. One second. So now it should be on full screen. Okay. We stopped at the end of the last lecture with the theoretical result that if you have a linear, linear bi-level optimization problem, that you know that the solution will be attained at one of the vertices of the high point relaxation. And this very much sounds like the simplex setting that you know from, from linear optimization, where you in the simplex method, in a nutshell, hop from vertex to vertex to find the optimal solution. This is our first algorithmic idea now as well for linear, linear bi-level optimization problems, which is then called the case best algorithm. And I will explain the algorithm and I will also explain why this is the name. And afterward, we will close the loop kind of to what we discussed yesterday. And we will discuss branch and bound methods to solve linear, linear bi-level problems. At the very end, we will also consider mixed integer linear bi-level problems in the final chapter of the lesson. Okay, so let's start. We have the setting here, which is more or less the setting which was proposed in the paper by Bialash and Kavan in 1984, which is the paper where the two proposed what is today known as the cave best algorithm. And the setting is exactly the same as we considered it in the geometric results section that we discussed at the end of the last lecture, okay? So in particular, this means that I still do not consider coupling constraints, okay? Everything else is rather general, okay? We also do impose the same theoretical assumptions as in the section on the geometrical results which is that the bi-level feasible set should be non-empty and bounded and that S of X is a singleton for all X in omega X, okay? Which means that for all possible leader decisions, we have a unique best response by the follower. You can generalize the algorithm that I'm now going to explain to you and I will tell you a bit where do you have to do what if you want to have a bit more general assumptions. Okay, so... The main idea, as I just told you, is that we know now that the solution is attained at one of the vertices of the shared constraint set, which is a polyhedron. So we can just search over these vertices and more or less the difference to the classic simplex case is that you always have to check for every vertex whether you are really bi-level feasible or not. Just because that you are but at the vertex of the shared constraint set does not mean that the Y component of this vertex is an optimal response to the X component at this vertex, okay? So this we also have to incorporate, yeah? And we start this algorithm by considering the high point relaxation. So here it is. It's all the constraints of both levels the objective function of the upper level and you just ignore the optimality condition for the follower. So this is the high point relaxation. And now implicitly, of course, you will not do this in practice and I will show you how you do it in practice, but assume that we are given the set of all vertices of the high point relaxation or of the shared constraint set. Okay, x1, y1, x2, y2, 2, xr, yr, okay? And here you see this ordered. So we put them in a specific order 
And the order is chosen such that these vertices always get larger or at least not smaller objective function values measured in the objective function of the leader. Okay, at least implicitly we can assume that this exists, although you would never ever compute all the vertices of such a polyhedron. So then solving the bi-level optimization problem is fully equivalent to finding the first vertex in this ordered set of vertices with the property that the Y component is an optimal response to the X component, which means that you are on the one hand in the shared constraint set, because you are a vertex of the shared constraint set. And on the other hand, you are bi-level feasible. Okay, so uh, you're an optimal response, so you are bi-level feasible. And if you then have this ordering as it is written here, it is clear that if you find the minimum index i that is bi-level feasible, this needs to be your global optimal solution. So the problem that we want to solve if we are given this ordered set of vertices is to find, and this is the notion that the authors in the original paper took, that you want to find the k star here, which is the minimum over all the indices from 1 to r such that xi and yi is bilevel feasible. This is then the kth best solution in your shared constraint set which corresponds to the best bi-level feasible solution in your feasible set of the bi-level problem. Okay, so this is already what I explained to you. And here's directly the listing. The only thing that we have to do is to deal with the situation that we of course do not pre-compute in a practical implementation all vertices of such a polyhedron. So we do this iteratively and we start in the first iteration with solving the high point relaxation. And the solution of this high point relaxation is called X1, Y1. And this is also the first entry in this ordered set of vertices because we get one of the vertices that has the smallest objective function value. So this is what we start with. And we put this vertex in the set capital W. Capital W always is the list of vertices that we kind of already have found, but not have yet inspected them. Okay. So now we only need to inspect this X1, Y1 vertex. And how we, do we do so? We check whether Y1 is an optimal solution of the X1 parametrized lower level problem. And how do we do so? Well, we simply solve the XI parametrized follow-up problem. This is what's marked now here. Okay. Let's assume that the optimal solution is Y tilde. Then we can check whether Y tilde is the same as YI. So the Y component of the vertex that we are currently inspecting. And if this is the case, we know that we have found the bi-level optimal solution. So we set K star to I and return the bi-level solution X, I, Y, I. So here already, I guess the first comment is in place because if we check that yi is an S of xi such that it is written here, we of course explicitly use the fact that the lower level problem always has a unique solution. Otherwise, you might get, for instance, another y tilde, which has the same objective function value, which is not this one here. And then you would miss this optimal point. Okay, so here, we explicitly require that the so solution set of the lower level is a single. 
Of course, this can be generalized, but then you have to make these checks here based on the objective function value instead of the solution, okay? So, but assume that yi is not an optimal solution for the lower level problem given the xi. Then we take the set capital, uh, capital wi as the set of all the adjacent extreme points of the currently inspected vertex xi, yi. So what does it mean adjacent extreme points? So this is just, if you are at the vertex of a polyhedron, if you just go over one edge and every such vertex that you can obtain by going over one such edge, this is an adjacent extreme point. So, and we only take those, oops, we only take, wait a second. Do you see my screen? Okay. Sorry. So we only take those adjacent extreme points that have an objective function value that is less than the one that we just inspected. Okay. All the other ones cannot be relevant anymore and we can exclude that. Okay. Then we maintain this set T here. This is the list of vertices that we are done with. Okay, so after the first iteration, we put x1 and y1 inside. And then the list of vertices that we have to still consider is the old set, capital W, unified with the set capital U double, capital WI here. And then you can subtract here, of course, all the elements that are in capital T. So this gives you the set of vertices that you have to inspect next. But then of course the question is, which one do you take next? And this is done here in step seven. So you then choose after you have incremented your iteration counter, the vertex X, I, Y, I that has the minimum upper level objective value among all the vertices that are currently in your set capital W. So you take the best next possible vertex. And then you iterate. So the main idea is start with the best vertex, check if it's bi-level feasible. If not, take the adjacent vertices that can still play a role and then choose the next one as the one which has the best of the remaining objective function values. Okay, maybe one and a half comments regarding the complexity of this method. So first of all, may, nobody tells you that you do not maybe have to inspect all the vertices. So this gives you the worst case complexity. Again, this is rather similar to what you have in the simplex method in linear optimization as well. Further, in every iteration, you have to solve one optimization problem, which is an LP, and this is the XI parameterized follow-up problem. This is the only optimization problem that you have to solve. This one down here also looks like an optimization problem and it is written as such. But note that you already have all these points here in this set. So you just have to evaluate the objective function, order them and take the minimum. Okay, so although this formally looks like an optimization problem, you don't have to call an LP solver for it. Okay, and then one other comment. If you would start to implement this, all would be smooth until you reach, usually, at least this is my experience and the period experience of my uh, co-workers, until you reach step six, because then you have to figure out on how to compute all the ext uh, adjacent extreme points. So 
I mean, this is not really bi-level related. I'm not going into the details here. A brute force method, for instance, for doing so is if you just think about the simplex method, if you are at the vertex, this is given by a basis and the non-basis, right? You know that from linear optimization. And by every pairwise exchange of basis and non-basis variables, you get all the adjacent vertices, okay? So just go to adjacent extreme point is the same than just changing one basis entry. And if you do all these pairwise changes, then you get the set of all adjacent extreme points. Okay, there is one question in the chat, let me see. Would it be simple at this point to extend this to coupling constraints too? I mean, at every vertex check only the second level optimality, but yeah, this is exactly the point. So the question is, what do you do when you have um, maybe ambiguity in the lower level solution set and coupling constraints? So the problem then is, I mean, if the lower level is always uniquely determined, then this check here is fine. And if this check is positive, you know that y tilde is yi, and this is also feasible for the upper level player, although that you have coupling constraints because it's a vertex of the shared constraint set. However, if this is not the case, it might be the case that if you solve this xi parameterized follow-up problem and you get a different solution, you also have to check if you have coupling constraints that you did not destroy the upper level feasibility. This is the crucial point then, okay? If you have another solution, which is not YI, but which is maybe an optimal response, so it has the same objective function value, it still might be the case, we had some graphical examples already in the morning lectures, that this optimal response then is not feasible anymore. And for this, you also have to check. Okay, so these are the remarks that I already made. Whenever you want to see or learn how you can compute all these adjacent extreme points, you can take a look in the bi-level book by Bart and there in the non-bi-level section, so the first 200 pages, I guess, and there is a so-called ranking procedure explained for linear optimization problems. This is uh, what he suggested to do here. Okay. Okay, this is it for the case best algorithm. Okay, if you have the theory with the vertices and the shared constraint set, this is rather easy to, to develop. Now let's consider branch and bound again. Okay, so now we almost do exactly the same as we did yesterday. So consider now this very general LPLP problem. We are allowed to have coupling constraints here and uh, we do not, impose any other assumptions, okay? And we have seen this morning that you can write down the KKT formulation, which is this one. What you get here is in addition to what you already have in the original problem, the dual polytope and the KKT complementarity conditions. So the bad guy of this reformulation is exactly what's marked here namely the, KK, uh, the KKT complementarity conditions. So first of all, this is the only nonlinear constraint of this KKT reformulation. And secondly, this is also the one we required some big M's for when we did this binary variable based linearization of this constraint. So the idea now is that you, let's go back, um, that you just do a branch and bound, but you don't do it on integer variables as we did it yesterday, but you branch on these complementarity constraints. So how do you do it? You start with what I call the dual extended high point relaxation. So everything up to here is the high point relaxation. And you also throw in the dual polyhedron of the lower level. Solve it. Okay. If you have solved it, I mean, this is, this is what I explained to you. If you have solved it, 
usually you will have some KKT complementarity conditions that are not satisfied, which means that for some index I, this product here of the dual variable and the primal constraint is strictly positive. This is now the same situation as yesterday when we considered a fractional variable to branch on next. So what we then do is we take such an index I that violates the KKT complementarity condition and construct two new subproblems. One in which we just set lambda i, the dual variable to zero, and the other one in which we simply take the primal constraint, the ith one, and put in the constraint that this one should be satisfied with equality. So by this, what you did is you, exactly branch on complementarity constraints as we yesterday branched on fractional binary variables, for instance. Okay. And of course, then you have two new sub problems. You choose one, you solve it. If you're lucky, then you get a bi-level feasible point. This gives you an upper bound again, okay? Every relaxation gives you locally in the subtree a lower bound. So all this branching and bounding is exactly the same as for the mixed binary case that I described to you yesterday. By the way, if you take the MILP reformulation with the big M and you then get this MILP and do classic branch and bound on this MILP. Branching on the binary variable is exactly the same as branching on the complementarity constraint, but there's one crucial difference. If you do it as such here, there is no big M involved. Okay? Via branching directly on the complementarity constraints, you don't have to take care about any big M at all. Okay. So a bit of notation so that I can show you the same theorems or lemmas um, as yesterday, but just in this setting. Okay. We're not going to prove them again. It's all the same. We just have to adapt it to this setting. So... Again, every node in the created branch and boundary then is defined by the root node problem and two index sets. Yesterday, this was capital Z and capital O. Now I call it capital D and capital P. They of course should be uh, disjoint because otherwise you might run into unnecessary infeasibilities. And the D here stands for dual and the P stands for primal, okay? So for all the indices in capital P, in that node, I put this constraint here in my constraint set so that the ith primal constraint is satisfied with equality. And for the indices in D here, I put in my constraints that the dual variable should be zero. And by this, I of course get the complementarity condition satisfied. Okay, so this is the LP relaxation, if you want, so of the node in the branch and boundary, which is defined by the index set pair P and D. Okay, this is the method. I'm not going over this now here in detail because it's really exactly the same as before. Maybe just let us discuss three important steps. Which, is the, which are the three pruning steps that we also discussed yesterday. So first of all, if I solve such a node problem and the problem is infeasible, I can directly prune the respective subtree because by putting in further constraints, it won't get feasible anymore. On the other hand, if I have a solution and if I have the fact that my solution is not better that my, that my compared to my current incumbent, the bounding lemma from yesterday applies and I can prune the respective subtree as well. Okay, and if 
I have a point, which is a solution of my node that satisfies all the complementarity constraints, then in this situation now, ah, I have found a new incumbent and I update my incumbent. I also do not have to create new sub problems. So I also go directly to step two here and iterate with the next problem. And in any other case, I choose a, let's call it still fractional I, but fractional now means that the KKT complementarity condition is not satisfied. I create two new sub problems and I iterate as I'm used to. Okay, exactly the same method. The theory that I will now show you is exactly the same theory from yesterday. So now I will be a bit quicker, okay? The relaxation definition here is exactly the same. Of course, we solve a relaxation in every node of the subtree or of the tree that I'm creating here. And since I'm only throwing away this overall optimality condition of the lower level problem, the wording relaxation is also reasonable. Okay, so the relaxation property that we then have to consider is that if you have this problem where you have the complementarity for all indices, and by further imposing that some should be primal active and some should be vanishing in the dual world, this is the, so to say, problem of the entire subtree. And if I forget just about this condition here, this is the only one that's missing above. Then you, of course, directly see that the above is the relaxation of the problem below. So, and by this, we again get the bounding lemma. It's exactly the same bounding lemma as yesterday. So if I solve the relaxation, I get a lower bound. And the infeasibility of the relaxation, of course, directly implies the infeasibility of the actual problem of the entire subtree so that I can prune both due to bounding with the incumbent and infeasibility. And again, both statements are an immediate consequence from what we had yesterday. And this was only due to the reason that, yeah, it's a relaxation that we consider. And we exactly the same, we get exactly the same branching lemma as yesterday as well. And we get exactly the same correctness theorem. Okay? It's just the same method. Okay, there's one question, I guess, again. How good are these two methods in practice? Um, I think with the two methods, um, what you mean is the cave best algorithm and the branch and bound method. Um, right now, I do not know really anybody who is considering the cave best algorithm. It's a, from a theoretical point of view, nice algorithm because it has so many analogies to the simplex case. And because you can directly apply the structural and geometric properties of your linear, linear bi-level optimization problem. When it comes to branch and bound, it depends. So if you have good bounds for your dual variables, so if you are able to set up big M's that are not too big, then just use Gurobi with the big M reformulation. Why not? I mean, you have a commercial solver that is highly performant, that is very robust. This would be my first choice. But I will also tell you how to implement such a branch and bound method as I just suggested it using the capabilities, the built-in functionalities of the modern commercial solvers. Okay, I will come to this in a minute. Okay, the proof again, the only thing at that point that we would have to show is the finiteness of the method. But since we only have finitely many lower level constraints, I mean, this is the assumption under which we work all the time here. We only have finitely many complementarity constraints. We have only finitely many branching decisions. That's it, okay? 
Good. So now, again, to the answer of this question, how to implement this method. So what you usually can do in such modern solvers like Gurobi or Cplex or Skip, you can use special ordered sets of type one. We discussed this already yesterday. A special set, a special ordered set of type one is a set of variables for which at most one is allowed to be positive and all others need to be negative. You remember I told you about that you can use this nicely for branching, etc. So this is again the formal definition. I just uh, gave this definition to you. And I abbreviate this property now in the following with SOS1 of x1 to xn. Okay. This should mean that x1 to xn form a SOS1 set. So, and this can be communicated when you implement the model to these modern solvers. Okay, like yesterday when I showed you the knapsack example, I set up some variables. And if you have some special variables that should be in an SOS1 set, you can say Gurobi or, for instance, Cplex, hey, Gurobi, these variables, by the way, should be in an SOS1 set. And we can use this method here right away for the KKT complementarity conditions. So for this, we introduce a non-negative auxiliary variable, let's call it SI, which is, which is nothing else but the slack of the ith primal constraint of the follower. So, and then we know that this complementarity condition is nothing else but that this primal slack and the dual variable should be in an SOS1 set for all i from 1 to L. So you can implement your model as such. And if you do so, the modern mixed integer linear solvers will do the branching on these SOS1 sets on their own. So by this, you do not have to implement the branch and bound method, but these solvers will mimic what I explained to you before by introducing to them these SOS1 conditions. The nice thing about this is that you then automatically, of course, use all the batteries included in these solvers. I mean, if you implement your branch and bound from scratch, I mean, if you're a bit experienced with implementing, you will have a working version in one afternoon. But you have no sophisticated branching rules. You have no sophisticated node selection. You have no pre-processing. You have no blah, blah, blah. All these things that all these commercial solvers use because it's implemented there in a very efficient way, you would have to implement on your own to be competitive. And I mean, to compete with a commercially driven software development team, for instance, as a single PhD student, usually is not a good advice, okay? So this is why I would suggest to just go such a way and then you get, I guess, the best method that you right now have for solving LPLP bi-level problems to global optimality. Maybe one more word on wait a second. On this problem. This is the high point relaxation extended by the dual polyhedron. And this is the problem that you solve in the root node of this complementarity branching branch and bound. There's one stupid or disadvantageous thing with it, namely that this part here is completely independent from everything that's written here. Which means that at the very beginning of your branch and boundary, you're a bit like in autopilot mode because you have not yet in introduced some kind of coupling between the dual and the primal world. Which means that you will get usually at the very beginning those high point relaxation solutions that are far from the bi-level feasible ones because you only develop 
via introducing the KKT complementarity conditions, the coupling between the primal and the dual world. And there are also some papers um, that, for instance, develop valid inequalities that you can put in, in the root node so that you already at the root node, for instance, have some coupling already so that you don't make too stupid decisions at the very beginning of your root node. So you can extend this setting and try to get better performing algorithms, of course. But as the basis, in my personal experience of the last years, this is the best performing method for linear bi-level optimization problems that I just described here. Okay. That's it about linear problems. So linear and continuous problems. You know a bit about how to model these things. You know the different solution concepts. You know about the single level reformulations and that you have to be careful when you use them in the nonlinear case. And you know a bit now about the theory of linear bi-level optimization and how you can use it to derive algorithms. Okay, so now in the final part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about mixed integer linear bi-level problems. Okay, so you might have now integer variables both on the upper level and on the lower level of your linear bi-level optimization problem. And what's going to happen now is very interesting because it's the complete different thing compared to what we have seen now. The branch and bound method that I just explained to you, I could go over it very quickly because it modulus some notation, it was exactly the same method than yesterday. So everything worked as expected. This is not the case anymore if we go to mixed integer linear bi-level optimization problems. Okay, so let's start. This is the problem that we consider. So we again have no coupling constraints. This is our simplifying assumption again, and I will show you in the algorithm where it might break if you have some. We have a linear, linear objective function. We have the optimistic notion. We have a linear lower level. The matrices and the vectors are defined as before so, so that everything fits together regarding the dimensions. The only difference now is that we use the sets capital X and capital Y for specifying integrality constraints on maybe a subset of the X and Y variables. Okay, so we consider the mixed integer case. So some of them are maybe allowed to be continuous and the other ones need to be integral. Okay, so maybe a word about the hardness of this problem. So of course, only regarding the decision, uh, excuse me, the definition, the shared constraint set omega is exactly the same as before. But of course, now this is not a polyhedron, but these are like um, the integer points or the mixed integer points in this polyhedron. Good. So moreover, I can also use again this optimal value function constraint here to model optimality. And also the definition of the optimal value function is exactly the same. However, Evaluating now this optimal value function corresponds to solving a parametric mixed integer linear program. This was an LP before. So checking the feasibility now corresponds not to solving an LP anymore, but an MILP. So this is a significant difference. Okay. And still, it's a non-convex object, this optimal value function. It's not continuous. And in general, it's very difficult to describe. This is not getting better, of course. Moreover, as I just said to you, to check whether a point, a given point, is a feasible solution now is already an NP-hard task. 
because it corresponds to solving a mixed integer linear program. Okay. And in this paper by Jaroslav from 1985, I already mentioned this at the very beginning. There he showed that K level discrete optimization problems are sigma K P hard. And this is the case even when all variables are binary and all constraints are linear. Okay. So if we have a two level, so a bi-level discrete optimization problem, we are in sigma 2p. So we are, so to say, one step further on the ladder of the polynomial hierarchy. Okay. So for those of you who know what this means, this means that you can solve the discrete bi-level optimization problem in non-deterministic polynomial time if you have an oracle that solves in constant time NP-hard problems. Okay. This is the one step further on the polynomial ladder. Okay. The other problem, I mean, it's, th this means, okay, the take home message is, ah, it's much harder. Okay. Already the complexity results show this. But there are some other difficulties. And this is the question of whether we attain optimal solutions or not. So, Already in the paper by Moore and Bart in, the 19, in 1990, uh, this is discussed, but the first really comprehensive paper, I, in my opinion, on this is the one by Vicente Savar and Judice from 1996, where they consider three different cases of bi-level mixed integer linear programs. The first case is the one in which only the upper level variables are discrete. The second one is the one where all variables are discrete, so the upper and the lower level variables. And the third one is the one in which only the lower level variables can take discrete variables, uh, values, excuse me. So the upper level variables are continuous ones. And their results are as follows. So the standing assumption is that all discrete variables are bounded and that the bi-level feasible set is non-empty, so that they are all bounded is Again, an assumption that is related to the decidability of the overall problem. So, and then the case one and the case two here. There they showed that an optimal solution always exists. The first one here can be reduced to a mixed integer linear program, provided that you have big M values. This is what we already know. And the second case here can be, I put this in quotation marks, reduced to a continuous but linear tri-level program. Okay, you can maybe use, the, you can more or less use the reformulation idea that I showed you before to model a binary variable with a linear bi-level problem that has coupling constraints. Okay, so these are the two good cases. The third one here, where only the lower level variables can take discrete variables, or, excuse me, values, but the upper level variables are continuous. Here, in general, you cannot know in advance that the solution will be attained. And the reason is that the bi-level feasible region then in these cases is not closed. Okay, and you know by the theorem of Weierstrass, if it's not closed, it's not compact, then you have a problem with existence of minima. Let's consider this in a, in a, in a specific example. And I think that the example by Köppe and co-authors from 2010 is the easiest one to see what can go wrong. So we consider this bi-level optimization problem. I already write the infimum here instead of the supremum because I will show you that the minimum is not attained. So what is the problem? I have upper level, I have one upper level variable, which is X, it's between zero and one, and it's continuous. The objective function is X minus Y, and Y is the solution of the lower level problem. And let's take a look to the lower level problem a bit more in detail. Here I have one variable, y bar. This should be an integer variable between zero and one. 
So it's a binary variable. And the solution of the lower level problem is the smallest integral value that is not smaller than the upper level decision X. So what is this? It's nothing else but rounding up. Okay, so this is just the sophisticated academic way of writing down rounding up. So this overall problem here is nothing else but this problem. So I know that the y variable here is x rounded up and x needs to be between zero and one. That's equivalent. And here you can rather easy see that the infimum is not attained. So let's start with the values here at one. Then you get one minus one is zero. Take one half. Then you have one half minus one, which is minus one half. If you take one over four, you get minus three over four and so on and so forth. So the infimum towards which you converge is minus one. However, minus one would only be attained if for X equals zero, I would still round up, but zero rounded up still is zero. So the infimum is never attained. So the solution is not existing. Okay, so this is, I guess, the, the, the nicest example to show that if you have continuous variables in the upper level problem, and if you have integer variables in the lower level problem, that this might lead to the situation that no solutions exist. And of course, by the way, we needed for this the integrality of the lower level variable, right? Because otherwise, we wouldn't not have been able to model this jumping behavior, okay? Okay, so as I just told you, the infimum is never attained. And in order to get rid of this nasty situation, what you find in almost all papers of integer bi-level optimization is that the authors make the assumption that all linking variables are discrete as well. So again, what is a linking variable? A linking variable is a leader variable that appears in the constraints of the follower. Okay? So, and if you assume that all these linking variables are also integer value, then you get rid of these nasty situations. You can show, by the way, that in order to just simplify the mathematical setting, that all non-linking upper level variables can be moved to the lower level, okay? If you're interested, you can find the details here in these two papers. And this effectively translates the assumption that all linking variables are discrete to the assumption that all upper level variables are discrete, because otherwise you can just move them down, okay? This is a special situation. This morning, we had some question on, can I move something from the upper to the lower level, especially when it's about constraints? No, you cannot in general. But in such a special situation here, you can prove that this is equivalent. Okay. Give me one second so that I, after five hours of talking, uh, can drink a bit. Thank you. So what we discuss next is we consider the famous example by Moore and Bart from their 1990 paper, which is maybe the most well-cited example in the literature on bi-level integer optimization. So this is the problem. So forget about the, the math on the left-hand side, just consider the picture on the right-hand side. So 
you have no constraints in the upper level except for the integrality constraints that tell you all your upper level decisions should be integral. All the variable, uh, all the constraints that you have are those four here, which define the polytope, which is the feasible region of the follower. These four inequality constraints you see here, one, two, three, and four. So the feasible set of the high point relaxation then are all the discrete points in this polytope. So all these black circles and all these green triangles. This is the feasible set of the high point relaxation. If I solve it, you see, I will mainly maximize y. So the solution of this high point relaxation is this point two, four here. The solution of the bi-level program is this larger green triangle here. So, the objective function of the lower level is to bring down y as much as possible. So whenever I take the leader decision one, this is the only feasible and thus optimal reaction. If I take two, I have these three points. I take the minimum one, it's this one. And then I take the minimum of these three ones, this one, so then same argument, these green, triangles here are the bi-level feasible points. Okay. So the discrete points are feasible for the high point relaxation. The point two, four is the solution of the high point relaxation. And here two, two is the feasible, is, is the bi-level optimal point. So the triangles represent the bi-level feasible solutions. And the last thing that we discuss here is that this dashed line here and here, this is the bi-level feasible set. If you consider the bi-level optimization problem in which you simply neglect all integrality constraints. Okay. And what you already see here, we have one lucky shot that a point that is bi level feasible for the problem in which we neglect all the integrality conditions is also a point that is bi-level feasible for the discrete bi-level optimization problems. For all the other points here, these two sets do not have something in common. We will come back to this fact later when we try to understand why this example is so bad for almost all the classic branch and bound ideas. So this we do in the final subsection now, which is the branch and bound method for mixed integer bi-level problems. So again, this is the problem that we consider. We have the integrality constraints in capital X and capital Y, and we have no coupling constraints in the upper level. So what we now do is to formalize a bit the things is we split the variables of the leader and the follower, so X and Y, such that we have index sets Cx and Ix for the continuous and for the integer variables of the leader and the same for the follower. So x, Cx and y, Cy are the continuous variables of the leader and the follower and x, Ix and x, uh, excuse me, y, i, y are the integer valued ones. So C always stands for continuous, I always stands for integer. 
And we make the standing assumption for the rest of this talk that the shared constraint set should be non-empty and compact, and that the projection onto the X space is also non-empty. So there are feasible leader decisions. Good. So the integrality, as I already showed you, oops, we encode them in these sets, capital X and capital Y. So capital X are all the vectors X that can be split as such so that the latter component is an integer vector and so the same for Y, okay? So NXI and NYI are the number of the integer variables in the lower level and in the upper level, okay? Good. So our goal now is to design a branch and bound method for these bi-level MILP problems. And of course, and this is, was the same idea by Moore and Bart in 1990 is to say, well, okay, let's do the same stuff that we know since the Land and Doig paper from 1960, and let's see where we get. So the main ingredient, of course, of the land and dog method are these pruning or as a synonym, fathoming rules that decide on which subtree I can ignore. Good. There's one question. Maybe I can check it. Check. Conducting a polyhedral study for the follower problem in order to be able to describe the convex hull of integer solution can make us escape from this annoying, this annoying scenario by dropping the integrality constraints. To be honest, I'm not sure whether I understand the question. Maybe we can move this question to after this lecture or maybe to the gather town meeting and then we can discuss it okay right now i'm not sure whether i understand that sorry okay so these were the three fathoming rules that we used in the classic branch and bound method the first one is if at the current node the problem is infeasible throw the subtree away the second one is if the current node problem is feasible and if you have a solution that is not better than the incumbent, throw the subtree away. And the lucky shot case, if the problem at the current node is feasible with respect now back in the LPLP bi-level setting for all complementarity constraints, Okay, then you're done with this subtree as well. And since we are now going to branch again on integer variables, rule through three here, then is like the problem at the current node is feasible with respect to all integrality constraints. So, and I guess when Moore and Bart, I never asked them personally, but when they tried it, I, I think that they hoped that most of these rules will carry over to the bi-level MILP case, but in fact, this is not the case. So let's discuss this a bit more. The first thing is, if you take a look at this example again, you see that the bi-level solution, it was this point two two. here. <clears throat> the objective function value, in this example of this optimal solution is minus 22. So now throw away all integer restrictions. Then we have seen that the bi-level feasible set is this dashed line and this dashed line. If you solve this problem, the point 0.81 here is the optimal solution and the corresponding objective function value is minus 18. And this is super surprising. Why? You throw 
you have thrown away constraints, all your integrality constraints, but you don't get a lower bound anymore. In the classic setting, we would have expected, no, we would have known that this value would have, would need to be a lower bound on the optimal objective function value. So in other words, just neglecting integrality constraints in a bi-level MILP is not a relaxation. Okay? This is the first key point out of this Moore-Bart example. You simply do not get a relaxation by ignoring the integrality constraints. And it's even worse. So this example is so nicely constructed that when you solve the problem in which you ignore all the integrality constraints, what you get is a point that is integer feasible. 8, 1 is a lattice point. In the other world, we would have said that, okay, we can prune. We solved the, in quotation marks now, relaxation, and we get an integer feasible point. So it needs to be optimal for the subtree. No, not the case anymore. Although this is an integer feasible point of the problem in which you neglect the integrality constraints, you cannot prune based on this because minus 18 is not a lower bound. So what this means is, so the first observation, the solution of the continuous, and now I put relaxation always in quotation marks because these relaxations indeed are no relaxations anymore. This does not provide a lower bound. This is observation number two, uh, excuse me, one. And observation number two is that if you solve the continuous counterpart, and if you get a solution that is feasible for the integrality constraints, you cannot use this solution for fathoming the subtree. So this means that rule two and rule three of the three fathoming rules that we applied according to Land and Doig are not valid anymore. The only thing that stays valid is to say, if the continuous counterpart has no solution, so if this is infeasible, well, then my problem is infeasible. This was the first rule and this can still be used. So let's take a look, and this is also taken from the paper by Moore and Bard. What happens if we do it anyway? So just ignore this fact and do branch and bound as you are used to. So this is the problem that they studied. Forget about the math, just take a look at the picture. So what you see is that you have this polytope and the bi-level or the integer feasible points in this polytope are the blue ones. So you have these three points that are integer feasible in the shared constraint set. And the optimal solution of the leader or of the follower, if the leader chooses X is two here, is that Y equals to two is chosen. This has the better value than this one for the follower. And since for X equals three, the follower can only react with Y equals one. This would gives you the objective function value of minus five. And since we are considering here now a maximization problem, this minus five here, so this point three one is the bi-level optimal solution. So 
What if we do branch and bound as usual on this problem? And for the node selection, we use depth first search. So we start here with the continuous relaxation in quotation marks, we get this solution. The second component is fractional. So we branch on it. We impose one new constraint and branch. So it should be larger than or equal to two. Then we get this solution. The first one is integral. We branch on this one. Then again, the second one is integral. We branch on this one. Here we get an infeasible problem. So we can prune. So now we do a backtracking in DFS. We would then go to node four here. And if you solve this one, now we have y should be not larger than two because the other one here was y should be at least as large as three. This gives us a bound in the classic notion of branch and bound of minus six. And then we do the backtracking, we go to this node, this is infeasible, we do some backtracking, we go to this one, we get a fractional solution, we branch on the first one, we get a fractional solution, we branch, we get infeasible, backtracking, back to seven, then we branch here, and now we come to node nine, and here we get the integer feasible solution to one. So usually, we would stop. We solve the relaxation that is integer feasible. So we stop. We don't go to this node here. So we would backtrack to seven. We would backtrack to six. We would back then go to 11. 11 is infeasible. And this is the entire search tree. So if we do so, we found two integer feasible solution, two, two, and two, one. Let's go back to the figure, these two ones. But since we would usually stop here, we would simply not see the optimal solution of the bi-level problem. So the algorithm is not correct. It does not work as expected. Indeed, what we would have to do now here is we would have to continue with branching, for instance, in this way, so that we would get to the optimal solution. But this is not branch and bound as we are used to it. Okay? So we really have to do different things. This is now the third observation. Whenever you have an integer feasible solution in a node, and the main ingredient now is that contains branching restrictions on the follower variables, then we cannot use this information to fathom this node. So if you take a look here again, why is the lower level variable that we, that we have a branching restriction on here? Okay. And by this, this is the reason why we cannot use this point here, the integer feasible point here to fathom this node. We will have some theoretical results on this that make it a bit more clear why the branching on the follower decision is so crucial or destroys the nice properties. Okay, but what we have learned up to now is that the classic method will not work. We cannot obtain relaxations in the classic way, and we cannot use the pruning rules as we know that. Okay, so before we come to the algorithm, some more notation. So this I already introduced, ix and iy, these are the index sets of the integer variables of the leader and the follower. Okay, then, for the integer variables of the leader and of the follower, we have upper bounds. We had the assumption that they need to be bounded anyway, so there need to be upper bounds. So these upper bounds I put in 
these vectors U, UX and capital UY, which are the IX and IY dimensional vectors of the upper bounds of the integer variables. Okay, whenever we have an integer variable that just by a variable bound is not bounded directly or better say explicitly, we simply set the corresponding entry in this vector to plus infinity. And without loss of generality, we can say that all initial lower bounds of all integer variables are zero. Otherwise you can could shift them and modify the constraints so that everything stays the same. Good. So, and of course, this can all be encoded in these sets, capital X and capital Y of the original problem formulation. And what we now do is we kind of introduce a new notation to represent the nodes of the subtrees and of the entire tree that we are now going to set up in our modified branch and bound method. And again, as before, these nodes in the tree are specified by branching decisions on top of the root node relaxation. And as we again branch on integer variables, we can specify the cave node corresponding here first to the leader variables x as or with these bounds x lower bar k and x upper bar k, which simply means that the variable in this node should be bounded below and above by these two bounds. And by the assumptions that we made before, the upper bound is not larger than this ux and the lower bound is not smaller than zero. And we do exactly the same for the y variables as well. Okay, maybe give me one more second. One more notation. Y naught or Y zero here stands for that we have no further branching decisions made on the follower variables, like in the root node. Okay, so what you of course now know is that whenever you have a node, so that you go along a path from the root to a node K and further to a node L. So when you go from the root to node L and if you visit K on this path, you know that the set XL is a subset of XK and YL is a subset of YK, which means that the lower bounds at node L are larger than or equal than those at node K for both variables X and Y. And the upper bounds at node L are smaller than or equal than the upper bounds at node K and the same again for Y. Okay, this I guess is clear. And then finally, we need these two sets. So R x k is nothing else but the set of integer variables j and i x for which we in node k already made some branching decisions so either x lower bar j k is strictly positive or x j upper bar k is strictly less than the originally imposed upper bound so this is just the set of variables, of integer variables of the leader for which we already included some branching decisions. And capital R, Y, K is the same for the follower variables. Okay, two more problems and then we can get the first results. Or two more problems. The first one is the continuous version of the mixed integer bi-level optimization problem at node k. 
So this is all the same as before, but in node K, I already have the bounds that belong to capital XK. That is, I have additionally these, in, uh, these inequality constraints. And then I also have to replace this set, uh, exclusive, excuse me, point to set mapping here, because in the lower level problem, Everything stays the same in node K, but I also have these bounds in YK. And of course this may, might change or usually will change my optimal response. So this is why I replaced here Y and S of X with Y and SK of X. Okay. This is the continuous bi-level linear program, CBLP. What we already know is this is not a relaxation of the integer variant of this problem. This is what the counter example by Moore and Bard showed. Okay. So the objective function value of this problem, we denote with F continuous at node K. So F K cont here. And we can also take this bi-level problem, which is the continuous counterpart, and consider the corresponding continuous high point relaxation, which is the original mixed integer linear bi-level problem, in which we omit the optimality condition on the lower level, and in which we neglect all integrality constraints, but we impose the bounds in XK and YK that belong to our branching decisions. Okay. That's a bit of notation, I know, but I, I try to explain it so that you can keep track. So let's consider, maybe I do this now without proof so that you can see the the theorems but the proofs are in the uh in the in the slides and you can read them afterward so consider that you have a node k with the bounds xk and yk and yk is y0 so this means for the follower you have not made any branching decisions okay so if you have a point x, k, y, k, that is the global optimal solution of the continuous high point relaxation, then the corresponding objective function value gives you a lower bound for this subtree. We have seen that in general, you don't get these lower bounds. The specific assumption that we have to make is here that we did not make any branching decision for the follower variables. In that case, we can kind of rescue the, th uh, the second rule of uh, Land and Doig because then we get lower bounds. The proof is, 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 uh, is rather easy and uh, not longer than four lines. But I will go to the next one. This is the second situation in which we can bound. So assume now you have again a node K with these bounds XK and YK and you solve the node problem. Okay. You can then use the high point relax, the continuous high point relaxation objective function value to get a lower bound if in this solution here, yk, none of the tightened bounds, tightened due to branch, branch, branching decisions, are active. So you are in a strict interior of the interval that is imposed due to branching. So in other words, what does it mean? It means, well, everything is still okay, if you have branched on the follower variables, but if these follower variables then never take on these tightened bounds 
I mean, this simply means that tightening was not important because you're still in the interior, okay? If you take a look back in the example, let's do this for a second. Here, you get y equal to one. But this is active with respect to this further imposed bound. So here you cannot bound because the assumption of the theorem that I just showed to you is violated, okay? So the example exactly fits into what I showed you in the theorem. So here I, I skipped the proof, it's a bit longer. And I also skipped the, the last corollary because this is uh, more or less trivial and only the uh, restatement of the other one. There's one question in the chat. So it is better to start branching on upper level variables when possible. Yes, I would do so. Okay. This is now the branch and bound method that we get if we exclude all the things that we are not allowed to do anymore. So let's go through this and this will be more or less the last thing that we do today. So you initialize your counter, you initialize your bound sets with the bounds of the original problem. You set these R sets to the empty set because you have not yet branched. And you set F star, which is your incumbent now to plus infinity. Okay, the first thing that you do is you, oops, uh, sorry, this is the problem if you have too many hyperlinks in your slides, then you have to be careful with where you click. So you solve first the continuous high point relaxation. If this one is infeasible, you go to this step seven. Assume that no other open node, no other open problem exists. Then you go to step eight. So if you then are in step, step eight, and this happens really at the first iteration, you know your original problem is infeasible. So F star is plus infinity and the original mixed integer linear bi-level optimization problem is infeasible. Okay, assume that this is not the case. And now we let F K H P R be the optimal objective function value. Whenever this is already worse than or not better than your incumbent, go to step seven as well. Okay. Otherwise, you go to step three and you solve the continuous variant of your bi-level program. If this is again infeasible, go to step seven. There the same happens as before. And otherwise you get a solution X, K, Y, K. But you do not know if this is integer feasible. Step four, if this is integer feasible, you go to step five, consider this first. We know that if we have already branched on the follower variables, we know that we might get something that we are not allowed to bound with. So what we do is we again solve the follow-up problem. We fix the upper level decision and solve the follow-up problem and get the point X, K, Y, hat, K. If this has a solution, we have the objective function value and then we have properly or probably an incumbent, okay? So we update the incumbent here. If it was not the case that we are integer feasible, we select a fractional leader variable or a fractional follower variable and bound it. So we construct new sets X, K and Y, K after we have incremented K to K plus one. We also update the capital R sets accordingly and go to step two again. 
<clears throat> okay, then the only thing that is left is after step five here, step six. So whenever you have everything fixed that you could branch on, you go to step seven again. So you are done if there are no other node problems that are still open, or you take a new node and go on with this node. Or you select such an integer variable for which the variable is not yet fixed and you bound it. Okay, you put one new constraint, this gives you one new problem and you bound it. Okay, that's it. So you do this until no more node problems are there. If you never updated your incumbent, you know that your problem is infeasible. And otherwise, F star is the global optimal value. So the question here is, since the branching and bounding decisions are different from those for MINLPs, which solver implements this MILP-based branch and bound method? To be honest, the one that you have to implement if you want to solve these problems as such. I will say you a bit more on modern solvers and where you can find them, okay? To be honest, when I saw this method for the first time, I didn't get it, okay? So, I mean, just go over it again, consider the examples again from the very beginning, and then you will get it, okay? But I find it a bit hard to understand why this works exactly as it works. Here are the theorems on it. So we have the proposition that if all follower variables are integer, everything is okay. And the second one is, if there is an optimal solution, and if all follower variables are continuous, then we can use either the feather, both the feathering rules two and three, and the algorithm also terminates. But still, this algorithm that I now showed you is pretty weak. The reason is that we cannot use all these nice branching and bounding, or not the, these, not branching, but not all the nice bounding information that we can usually use. So that's why these algorithms based on these ideas are much weaker. There are more modern papers. I will let you know about some of them in a minute that you should use, but you won't understand them if you do not know this basic method by Moore and Bart, because there you really learn where you have to be careful if you design a branch and bound method for mixed integer linear bi-level problems. Okay, so I think I'm pretty sure you can only go to the other ones if you really understood what's going on here. Okay, good. So final slides. This is more or less the slide that I showed you at the very beginning. So I won't list this again all. I hope that I could give you a bit of my fascination for this field. So I find these problems very interesting because they have very surprising and challenging properties. So you can do nice designs of algorithm with it. You can do nice theory work if you want to do it. There are a lot of open questions. And maybe this is even more important for you. There are very many problems in the real world that you have to model as such if you really want to capture decision-making in reality. Okay? So there are very many good reasons for considering bi-level optimization uh, problems. And I hope that after this day, you got a bit of the, the taste of it and that you will go on with it. Okay, so we have not looked at very many other things. So for instance, as I just said to you, there are other branch and bound and especially branch and cut methods that are much, much better than the Moore and Bard method that I just showed to you. The tipping point in this literature is this paper by Denegre and Ted Ruffs in 2009. This is the first branch and cut paper and their cutting plane method that they introduce leads to the fact that they can reuse many of the traditionally used bounding ideas 
which was not possible with the Moore and Bard method that I showed you. And even more, it's a bit unfortunate, but here in this et al of these papers, there is all Ivana Lubitsch inside, so the, one of the organizers of this school. And these methods, in my opinion, are the state of the art of solving mixed integer linear bi-level programs. They have a code online. You can download their binary and solve problems with them. You can also download the code by Ted Ralphs. So if you want to solve such problems, go to these guys, Fischetti and Lubitsch and co-authors and Ralphs and co-authors. They have the up-to-date methods. We did not talk a lot about pessimistic bi-level optimization, especially for the computational cases. I showed you nothing. All this was algorithms for the optimistic case. I almost showed you nothing about nonlinear bi-level optimization. So what about the situation when you have real nonlinearities? If you are interested in this, go to the book Foundations of Bi-Level Optimization by Dempe, and you will find a lot of information and thousands over thousands of literature references. A very hot topic right now, and it's getting hotter, I guess, in the future, is bi-level optimization under uncertainty. This is rather well understood in the single level setting. You have stochastic optimization, you have robust optimization, but all these things are not yet that settled for hierarchical optimization problems, okay? And many other topics as well. So if you're still asking what you shall do in your PhD thesis on bi-level optimization, here are some things that I would find interesting. The first thing is, if you have these mixed integer problems, can you design an algorithm that works with continuous linking variables? I just said to you that we ignore this. I don't know anything in this direction that really works well. The entire field of computational optimization in the bi-level setting is very much lacking further cutting planes. You have 1 billion cutting planes in single level optimization, and maybe you have something like seven in the bi-level world, okay? And then also other computational questions. What about pre-solve? That's a very hard topic in bi-level optimization. I showed you this IIC property, which is not satisfied anymore. You, how do you do bound strengthening in an efficient way so that it still remains the same problem? Not yet solved, I guess. What about computational bi-level optimization in the pessimistic sense at all? Not much. Bi-level under uncertainty, not much. And if you're more on the programming side, we all would benefit a lot by more open source codes and well-curated bi-level instance sets. Okay, more and more people are working on computational issues here, but the tools that we use are still very much in their infancy. Okay, so these are, of course, only some ideas that I have depending on my personal point of view. If you ask other persons in the field, they will give you completely different ideas, okay? It's just that you have something that you can do if you want to go in this direction. Okay, perfect. Then the last slide, or the penultimate slide, here again is the URL of the lecture notes, which are more or less the basis of what I showed you today. Whenever you have any feedback, this is a living document. Just let me know. We are happy to correct every mistake. For sure, there will be mistakes. Okay, we will extend it from time to time. So if you're interested, just look there from time to time. And then I used five more minutes that I was allowed to. But then I say thank you for all your attention. Um, this was rather tough. I mean, this was now almost 12 uh, lectures or... Uh, in, in, in two days up to now. And um, I hope that you liked it. And I hope that you're a bit interested now in the field. And uh, finally, enjoy the Germany match tonight. Bye-bye.
whenever you have some more questions, ask them now, ask them later, ask them when we meet in the gather town meeting, write me an email, um, whatever you like. Okay. Uh, so Martin, we make a break now. Yes, I think so. And then we start again at uh, four past uh, past past fifteen. Uh, when does the the exercise class start? Four past fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Then just let me, let's meet five minutes earlier. That that should be enough, and then we can set up everything. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, see you. See you.